You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. Hey TYT, I'm Nomi Kunst. We have a special guest today out of Iowa. Uh, Pete D'Alessandro is a candidate for the congressional district, this district three in Iowa, which includes Des Moines and it borders Nebraska and Missouri. A very interesting district. It is a conservative leaning district, but there is a heated primary, which is pretty unusual for a conservative leaning district. Uh, there's somewhere around six candidates right now for the Democratic line for the primary. And uh, Pete is is an interesting candidate because he has already gotten the endorsement at this stage of not just our revolution and our revolution uh, Iowa, the central Iowa chapter, but the National Nurses Union, a people for Bernie Sanders, and why would I bury the lead, Bernie Sanders himself. Bernie Sanders has been sending a lot of people emails on behalf of Pete Alessandro. Perhaps that's because uh, he's known for being progressive, but he also uh, worked on the 2016 presidential campaign for Bernie Sanders in Iowa, that important state where I think some would say he probably could have, should have, would have won it. Uh, he also w uh, worked as a state director in Indiana and Oklahoma, and he was the national delegate director for Bernie Sanders from Vermont uh, later on in the campaign. But way back when, which I'd love to talk about, he also worked for Paul Wellstone. Uh, if you remember Paul Wellstone, he was a progressive hero and a lot of people had hopes for him, but he tragically passed away in a plane accident in the early 2000s. So Pete, thank you so much for, for joining us. You and I go back. Absolutely. Thanks, Nomi. It's great to be here. Yeah, very exciting. So, uh, you know, you're, you're like a campaign operative. Is that it? Are people I, wondering, like, li how I, would you I'm switch not roles? Not like. <laughs> not like. I am a campaign operative and I'm proud of it. I'm, you know, I'm, I've been an organizer for 25 years. Uh, uh, organizing uh, not just candidates uh, in campaigns, but organizing issues and 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 uh, things like that that I believe in. And so um, I don't think it's as uh, it, it's not the most normal thing that you see in politics, but but it's happened enough where it's not uh, totally out of the realm. And I've actually think you know we've actually uh, elected a, a quite a few uh, really good uh, uh, legislators throughout our history uh, who started out as uh, campaign organizers of. Uh, uh, certainly Paul Wellstone would be a, a pretty good example of someone that came out of an organizing root, roots, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, that came out of organizing first uh, and then and then used elect, uh, elected politics, which has to be part of the process, mm -hmm. uh, and then did it themselves and obviously uh, uh, done it well. But there's been others. So uh, we it is unique, but we, we don't think it's uh, the most un, un, unheard of thing. We have presidents. Happened. We, you know, the mayor of New York. There's, yeah, it's, it's much more common. It's probably, I don't know. I, I guess personally, I don't understand why it's as odd uh, when you have lobbyists <laughs> become elected right. officials and bank executives, and we don't turn, you know, we we don't turn our heads and say, why is a banking executive representing progressive beliefs? But yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I think in a lot of ways, uh, what we're hearing around the district, uh, which I. I guess we knew intuitively this is one of the reasons we decided to do it uh, is uh, you, you kind of get the best of uh, both worlds in the sense that, uh, you know, I understand the process. Mm -hmm. I understand what it takes. But, you know, as an organizer, you're also not a career politician. And so you're able to mix both of those things that I think people are looking for. You know, what we're learning, sadly, uh, away from the terrible politics of, of the man is that um, m much of the uh, problems that, that President Trump has every day uh, is just uh, centered around the idea that he doesn't know how the system works. Right. Never cared how it worked, wasn't intellectually curious enough to figure out how it worked. And so when that happens, you, you, get, the, you get the negative twofer of the non-politician who doesn't understand what's going on. Uh, I think the Bernie Sanders and the Paul Wellstones and the Mayor de Blasio's and folks like that are the positive of it, which is what we're trying to be, where you understand the organizing, you understand the government, the politics part of it, you care about it, mm. and you're able to merge both things because you're not necessarily tied to uh, the everyday uh, uh, government part of things that has been really some of the things that we've needed to fight over the course of the last generation. So why do you think, given how conservative this district is, and in, 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 in terms of Cook, how, what, what's the the number? Is it R plus? Well, well, well yeah, and I'm going to push back a little bit on that. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think this is a district that is uh, 
is is truly a a take back district. It's truly a a, 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 a not just that we can flip it this year, but but I think it really is a toss up mm-hmm. in in every one sense of the word. Uh, if you look at the district, Barack Obama won it twice. Wow, he won the actual district, and then if you took the counties that were that make up the district, and and and, and if they had been together in two thousand and eight when he ran, I think he would have won it by almost ten points. Hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The other thing I think that's important is uh, if you look at the district, Donald Trump did win it by four points. But if you look at the places where he ran up the score, so to speak, uh, to get to a four point win in in November, a lot of those counties were counties that we did, meaning the Bernie Sanders campaign, did very well in, Mm -hmm. uh, if not won on caucus night. So I think when you put those things together, and, and, and you get to the realization that Barack Obama won the district twice, that in a lot of the places where Trump did well in in, in the fall, uh, the, the, the Bernie Sanders did very well in, 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 in the winter. Uh, I, I think it's, it's not as uh, uh, conservative leaning. And the other thing I would say is it, it is almost one third independent now, hmm. uh, the district in terms of registration. We do have voter registration here in Iowa. And a third of the folks, uh, about a third of the folks don't consider themselves Democrat or Republicans. I think there's a message in that. One of the reasons that Bernie Sanders was able to do well on caucus night was the appeal to independence. Mm-hmm. So that alone tells us that those issues appeal to independence and independence uh, are the key here. I think a lot of independents here are actually left of center. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 uh, and one of the reasons that they don't pick a party is uh, for the last generation, I think that's kind of a... Um, uh, pock on both their houses kind of uh, uh, situation where they agree with us on almost everything we talk about, but they just don't feel comfortable with being associated right now. That's that's one of the other things we have to start doing over the course of this next uh, few cycles is we not only have to stand for progressive values, I think that's the way to win. Mm-hmm. That So that's, I don't think that's as controversial as some folks might think. I don't think you have to moderate anything and we shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't be nuancing anything in terms of what matters. Uh, but I think if we do that, you'll see a lot of those independents coming back because the Democratic Party will be a place that they will feel comfortable with again. And it won't be the same old, same old that we've seen over the last generation. Do you think that the Cook metrics and the, the polling that's being done out there is sort of based on the wrong assumptions? Meaning if, if, if you and other organizer, organizers on the ground um, feel that the districts are more progressive leaning. Where in the polling are we messing up? And that I, we I don't know if it's messing up. I, mm-hmm. I think polls can only poll who they're talking to. Mm. So, so uh, you, you know, if, if you're going to do a poll about a primary, you're going to talk to likely primary voters. And you're going to have to go through all those screens to get to that. Look, I saw it in three places. I saw it here mm-hmm. uh, as the campaign coordinator. I was in Oklahoma when we woke up on election day and the The polls and the experts and all that kind of stuff were saying that we weren't going to win there. And then my favorite I talk about is I woke up on Indiana and it's actually not in this room I'm in right now, but on my office wall, I have I have it framed now. Uh, You know, I woke up the morning of the Indiana primary and I was told that uh, 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 by um, uh, one 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 group that did such things that uh, that we had uh, less than 10 percent chance of winning. The Indiana primary, which we wound up winning by four or five points that day. So I just think that it's changing so fast and and the issues that are resonating are resonating with so many people that are not, quote unquote, the usual suspects Mm -hmm. that that it's not that the polls, the the polling numbers are polling correctly still who they're polling. They're just not able to grab uh, the amount of people that are energized by issues like uh, a Medicare for all that are mm-hmm. that are energized by issues like we we've got to guarantee that every working person has a, a fifteen dollar um, minimum wage. Those type of issues, uh, th- th- those folks aren't being talked to, and the folks that are being energized to get re reintegrate or get into the political process because of those issues are often not talked to in these polls. Well, I, I guess I asked that because uh, you know a couple of days ago there was a memo that was leaked from the DCCC and. You know, you're running for Congress, and and you're a Democrat. Um, <laughs> I don't know how comfortable you are speaking about the D Triple C right now, but uh, there was a memo that was leaked, and there was a lot of pushback because uh, some of the guidance that they were given, and they were giving other candidates, 
was based off of some some faulty polling, some intentionally faulty polling, some misrepresentative polling. And, you know, that shapes how candidates run for office. They were suggesting that candidates should, you know, steer clear of Medicare for all and send out thoughts and prayers uh, after a mass shooting, (laughs) (laughs) which didn't um, work out very well for a lot of Democrats. Look, but see, what you just described, Mm -hmm. and and I I, I don't know about this, believe it or not, I don't get on a lot of uh, the the, uh, triple C phone calls and um, and, and, and they have not been unfair to us here by any stretch. Mm-hmm. I don't want to I don't want to imply that. But, you know, we're running our campaign right. and we're running it about what we want to talk about and what we think needs to be talked about. But what you just brought up is actually a, a, a specific uh, example of the larger problem is maybe now this might sound like a really nutty idea. Maybe candidates running for office shouldn't be polling things to see mm. what they should be saying. Maybe candidates should be running on what they believe in and seeing if those issues and those causes can get enough votes to win. And then even if you don't, at the end of the day, you still stood for something Mm -hmm. that you felt needed to be stood for. So I think part of the reason that a third of the people in this district are independents is because we've had too much of the poll tested Mm -hmm. uh, uh, candidates, the poll tested, how am I going to talk about an issue? You know, the one thing that drives me the craziest, and I'm going to get real specific with you on here, is when I hear a Democrat talk about, you know, I just want to make sure that I can be part of the solution so that so that everyone has access to health care. That drives me crazy. That is a poll tested way of not having to say, how you're going to solve the problem. Mm. Now, I think the problem solved with Medicare for all. That, that's how we say it. We don't, we don't nuance it. We don't talk about it any other way. But when you hear people say that, that goes back to this problem of these to- poll tested, don't offend anybody because you might be able to get the 51% if you don't offend enough people. And then we're going to have power and then we're going to be in and we might be able to incrementally do some you know, decent things. I think we have to start, one of the things we talk about in the theme of this campaign is we have to stop tr- trying to just win elections. Oh, a wave might bring in the Democrats in November. Oh, if we say it this way, we, we, we won't offend anybody. Mm-hmm. We have to start trying to win the future again. And if we start trying to win the future, I think we're going to win elections. Don't get me wrong about that. But part of that is not poll testing everything and not dumping information uh, out there so that people can find the four things they might agree with, but you don't have to talk specifically or engage the voter because believe it or not, maybe every now and then through these disagreements, we actually come to the solution because we're actually talking to people. And maybe we actually get a few people that weren't with us from the beginning to start realizing that what we're talking about could be the way that we win the future. And it's not just these uh, these uh, 30,000 foot, let me talk about an issue so you know I care about it type of stuff. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's no, it, very much kind so. of, but, but, but that's one of the things that drives me crazy is that we've got to move away from that. And if we move away from it, we'll see less and less mm-hmm. districts where a third of the people are independent. Mm-hmm. We're going to see more and more people saying, yeah, I'll put that D next to my name again, because they're standing for the things that matter to me, matter to my community, matter to my family. And they're not just trying to win an election to, to, to keep a brand uh, uh, at the top of the shelf. You have a lot of competition right now in your race. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not familiar with every single one of the candidates, but my guess is, uh, given how many folks are out there right now doing exactly what you said, sort of creating the illusion of being a progressive without actually like putting their foot down and saying, I am for this, it, you know, being yeah. caught between two worlds. Um, the process in Iowa is, is a little different than, than most states. How yeah. can you make sure that your affirmative progressive message uh, stands out in this this muddled process. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the process to our audience sure. as well. Well, well Iowa, I, I believe there's only one other state that does it this way. Uh, uh, so there's very few folks uh, that would be listening uh, that would uh, have experienced this. But Iowa has a law that if you don't get 35% of the vote in a primary, uh, we don't go to runoff. Uh, we, we actually have a convention. And those are folks that are elected. Uh, the, actually, the process already started. The rest of the country watches it every four years. But um, in, in off years, people are still elected at their precinct caucuses to go to their county conventions as delegates. And then at their county conventions, they're elected to go to their uh, 
congressional district conventions as delegates. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, uh, there's going to be 270 some odd folks that will be elected as delegates uh, to the to their congressional uh, district convention. If nobody gets 35 percent of the vote in June, about two weeks later, there'll be a convention to nominate the uh, Democratic nominee. So there's a two prong process. Now, we're trying very hard. We're working as hard as we can uh, to get our message out. We think it's a message that resonates uh, and to win in June. But if you don't win in June, you have to go fight it out at a convention. And uh, something I, I want to be clear about, I say this everywhere I go, uh, there are five other folks uh, running in this race. Uh, I'm running a race about what I believe in, what I think we should stand for. I'll let the others uh, speak for themselves and speak for their experiences of why they think they would be a, uh, the, the proper uh, nominee. But the one thing I do, I do say is that I have a lot of respect for all the folks I'm running against in this race. And clearly any one of them would, would be a better uh, option than, than um, David Young is in terms of the things he votes for. And, and, and that's something that uh, I, I think we have to be, be very clear about. You know, David Young is a very interesting uh, can, uh, congressman. We have a guy here in Iowa that everyone knows named Steve King. Mm -hmm. and, and people know of Steve King nationally because he's a bigot. Uh, he's, he's not ashamed for some reason of being a bigot. He's very loud about being a bigot. And he will climb up to the tallest mountain and let the whole world know that he's a bigot. Well, what's interesting, I think, is the style is what makes folks realize that this guy's there, the Steve King character. Um, David Young actually has a worse voting record. Uh, he, he's actually voted with uh, Donald Trump 98 percent of the time since Donald Trump's been president. So in a lot of ways, politicians like David Young, who you don't really know who they are, mm -hmm. because he does have a good personality. He does treat you with respect if you go to his town hall meeting. But then he goes back to Washington and he doesn't vote mm -hmm. with, with, what, with, with the respect that we need uh, to build our, our, our state, to build our, our society. Uh, so the fact that his record is basically Trump's biggest enabler, uh, I think the fact that we don't uh, look at him in the same way because he's not as loud and he's kind of um, uh, masked on who he really is makes him more dangerous. And that's, and that's one of the reasons we have to take him on and we have to take him on with a bold agenda. Do you have a sense of, of how scared he is right now? I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I've, I've met the man a couple times. Uh, I, I would doubt he would remember when he met me. I, I, I don't know if he, I don't know if, I don't know if he, he's scared or not, but he should be. Uh, because uh, because you're the Bernie Sanders candidate right now, well, so that's, that's something to be scared of. Come on. <laughs> well, well, well no, but you know what's interesting is is, is that um, uh, Congressman, uh, one of the the things I tell folks, and you brought up uh, Paul earlier, mm -hmm. uh, is when I'm out on the when I was first deciding whether to do this, and I think we talked really early on when I was doing an exploratory, mm -hmm. and uh, I would go. You know, we have 16 counties in the district, and and re regardless of what county I was in whether I was at a, a, a Democratic Party event, whether it was at an event we had put together, whether it was at a nonpartisan event, whether it was a, uh, in, a, in a, uh, uh, a library or, or in a uh, auditorium or whether it was at a coffee house. As I was leaving, uh, I would always hear in the back of my mind, I tell people this, in the back of my mind, I could hear Paul's voice. Mm. And he used to say, he used to have this line, he would say, he'd say you know, sometimes in order to, to win a fight, you got to pick a fight. And, 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 and I just... It just hit me that this guy was this guy was someone who needed a fight picked with him. Hmm. And, and one thing I will guarantee progressives, uh, it, it, if I'm honored to be the nominee, he will know in November that he was in a fight. That's the one thing I will guarantee to everyone uh, who is interested in progressive politics, everyone who's uh, who's interested in winning uh, for the future and winning for the right reasons. This guy will know he's in a fight. I don't know if he's had many in his life. I, I don't know him that well. But he'll know he was in one if, if, if I'm the nominee. I guarantee you that. Oof. Those are some fighting words. Hmm? I would love to end it on that, note, lot, but I have to ask you to, one but, question. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, but there's, but okay. no, no, there, there's a lot. There are so many important things. They are fighting words because there's so many things worth fighting for right now. We, we're, we're right on the cusp. We can mm -hmm. do this. We can elect enough people around this country to guarantee that health care is no longer just a privilege. Mm -hmm. That, that it's a birthright because we know it is. And we can do that with a Medicare for all system. There's enough people out there fighting for that. We can elect people that know that in, look, the one thing I say about the $15 hour minimum wage, I get it. It's an economic issue. Of course, it's an economic issue. It's a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. If you work 40 hours a week, your family should live in dignity. End of statement. 
The debate starts at $15 an hour. If you do everything you're supposed to do, you work hard, you should be able to go to secondary education, whether it's a, a university, whether it's a college, whether it's a trade school, whether it's an apprenticeship program, and you shouldn't have to worry about being buried in debt when you come out of uh, any of that. So it is worth fighting for. And it, it, and it is worth, because it, it's the society, look, 100 years from now, when they look back on us, they're not going to say, oh, there was a really bad Congress and the Congress didn't get it. 100 years from now, 150 years from now, when they're judging us, they're judging all of us. They're mm -hmm. judging what we made happen for this society. And so they're not going to nuance it and say, well, there, was, uh, there weren't enough congressmen that got elected. It will be the American uh, people, the American society that will be judged on it. So I think it's worth, those are things that are definitely worth fighting for. Pete Alessandro, running for Congress in Iowa's 3rd District. We're going to be watching. The convention's and, coming up and exciting, right? And Pete, yeah, and it's uh, PeteForIowa.com. My, my, someone's looking at me right now saying I'm supposed to say that. So <laughs> okay. I'm getting used to that, all right? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Thanks. Always Take great. Care. All right, Nomi. If you like the interview that you just watched, I got great news for you. If you become a Young Turks member, you can watch them live as they happen. Only the members get that. You also get uh, Young Turks live. You also get Aggressive Progressive live and Old School live. Everything is available for the members and commercial free. tytnetwork.com slash join.